these mist covered mountains are home now for me. But my home is the lowlands and always will be. Someday you return to your valleys and your farms, and you know. Welcome to Book Time with Ryan. I am Ryan. Today I'll be talking about Ben McIntyre's The Spy and the Traitor, the greatest espionage story of the Cold War. Intense. Intense. I gave it five stars. I'll just tell you that. I did not realize how intense it was going to be until I read it, which I'm pretty sure is how reading works. But I should have known when I got to this little blurb on the front from John le Carre, my favorite author. The best true spy story I have ever read. I agree. I found this book because I had read A Spy Among Friends, which is about Kim Philby, a KGB spy that was in MI6 and spied for decades. And his spying led to the death of many spies, not only for MI6 in Britain, but also the CIA and allies. So that was an Englishman spying for the KGB on British intelligence, a mole with an MI6. This is the kind of the inverse. This is a KGB officer spying for MI6 and that story. One of the great spies that we know of from the Cold War. This is a time period uh, after Kim Philby's spying. Uh, this is 60s, 70s, and mid-80s, but the impact was ongoing. The spy, the traitor involved in this book is Oleg Gordievsky. I'm not going to say a lot of names because I don't know how to pronounce Russian names. The, the main person in this is Oleg Gordievsky, and he was an up-and-coming KGB officer who was stationed in Copenhagen and was approached by uh, MI6 and the PET, which was Denmark's intelligence service. Before this point, he had a brother that was in the KGB. He had a father who was in the KGB. His mother was not a, a full-on supporter of the Soviet Union's approach to, to rule because it was horrible for the people. And he had a grandmother who was religious and tried to hide some of the prayers, some of the religious aspects of her life because it was illegal. So he had probably some seeds of dissidence sown before the invasion of Czechoslovakia by the Soviet Union, the Prague Spring and the backlash. And that I think was a major turning point for him. He started feeding information to MI6 and kept doing that. Eventually was rotated out of Copenhagen and back to Moscow. And at that point he was having an affair, but really his, his marriage, which was a marriage of convenience for a KGB officer, was falling apart. So he took a hit in the promotion department by getting a divorce and marrying this new person who also had KGB backgrounds. Um, she worked for KGB. She wasn't as high up, but her whole family had been KGB. Eventually, he finds a new position, and that is somewhat facilitated by the fact that many spies have been purged from England, and he was taking English and trying to be more qualified for a posting in England which he got. So he had been off the radar for about three years. And there was a plan, codenamed Pimlico, to 
exfiltrate from the Soviet Union. And this was going to be this elaborate plan to get him out of Moscow, up through Leningrad, along the Finnish border, through Finland, into Norway, from Helsinki to Oslo, and from Oslo to London. It had never been done before, going behind the Iron Curtain, way behind the Iron Curtain, to Russia to get somebody out. But this plan had been created years ago, and it was rehearsed for official staff in Moscow. Well, eventually, he finds out that he's going to be in the residentia, residentia of London, which is a huge boon for MI6 and MI5, the intelligence services in the UK. And he feeds them more and more and more about all of the agents, officers, the political outlook, briefed Margaret Thatcher, and briefed Gorbachev before Gorbachev became prime minister and was instrumental in providing extremely valuable political intelligence. There are little things that happened in this book, which I say in this book in real life, that's what makes it so intense. There are things that happened in this book that start to clue you in that things are not gonna go perfectly. There is a traitor in MI... Am I five or am I six? I'm a pretty minor one, but but uh, enough to scare Olyevsky. And the major traitor that impacts Olyevsky is Aldrich Ames, a CIA officer who gives up 25 names, I think, of operatives in Russia who are probably picked up interrogated and executed. If you were spying on the United States or the UK, you would get a court case and you were probably in prison for life, for 20 years, for 10 years. If you were a spy caught spying on the Soviet Union, generally you would disappear, You'd be recalled to Moscow, tortured, interrogated, and executed. A bullet to the back of the head in the basement of, I think, Lubyanka. So, at some point, Ames provides a bunch of different names. And one of them is the high-ranking KGB officer in the UK. Olyevsky is recalled to Moscow, and he's fearful, but he also, it may also be that he's briefing Gorbachev on England. But then while he's there, it, it becomes clear that something's changed. And his wife and his two daughters are recalled from the UK with the idea that something has happened to Gordievsky and they need to go home and take care of him. But it's really just an excuse to get them back into to Russia. So the handlers of Olyevsky know that something has, has really gone bad here. He's interrogated with truth serum. He fights back against that. And the person who's interrogating him really wants to find the proof. A lot of these people have lived through kind of the purges during Stalin's days. And there is some desire to have some kind of proof before you execute somebody. Because they realize that they could easily be the next person who's suspected. And when you don't have a process of determining the truth of something, um, it's very easy to go down the road of Anytime there's any kind of suspected wrongdoing, true or not, people are just executed. This is where it gets really intense, and and it, it, it's hard to recap, but it's basically there's this whole process to get them out of Russia. They, Operation Pimlico takes effect. It's elaborate, intense, and not unbelievable, but just it was stressful reading it, and I was not at risk in any way and I had to stop to do something and I just had to tell my wife what I was reading because it was just it's just amazing it's amazing that how close he came multiple times during his life maybe for me this is the most modern true 
spy story I've read because it, it really goes through post-Cold War espionage. It was a great book. I mean, it, John le Carre says it's the best true spy story he's ever read. And he's the best spy storyteller I've ever read. That's a pretty big endorsement. I have one complaint about this book. One complaint. And I'd love to hear how people deal with this because I don't know if I'm doing it wrong. This is not unique to this book. This is not the first time this has happened, but it was a little more in your face this time for me. This book has two sets of pictures and, and they're nice and they're, they're good, really good things to read about. There's Gordievsky. Here's his eventual wife, she's attractive. And then there's another set of pictures later in the book, which are later in the story. When I get to these parts, I read, I get to the pictures, I look through all the pictures and read the captions, read, get to more pictures, look at the pictures, read the captions, and finish the reading. But there are pictures in the picture section that deal with events that are later in the book that I haven't gotten to. Which means that if I look at all the pictures and I read the captions, I will discover things from the picture area, the photograph area, which will allude to things that happen in parts of the book that I haven't gotten to yet. And for this kind of book, it really gives you more of an idea of how things are going to shake out for a leg. Gordievsky. How do you deal with that? Do you read the entire book and then go back and look at the pictures? If that's what you do, why did they put it in the middle of the book? Do you read the captions, look at the pictures? If you do that, does that ruin it for you? Have you had that experience, a similar experience of what I'm describing? How do you deal with the pictures in a nonfiction book? Now, I think most of the time it doesn't matter. I think a lot of books where you're going to have photographs nonfiction. It's not giving away anything. If I have pictures about whales in a whale book, even if I see the pictures, I'm not going to like, the plot is not going to be changed. It's about whales. It's all just fact. For this, a book that is nonfiction, but reads like a thriller, it can give stuff away. So I don't know how they could deal with it. I don't know if this is a common thing that other people run into, but I'd love to know. Let me know if you've dealt with this, how you cope with mid-book photographs, especially in nonfiction, especially if it's a spy book. I'd really love to know how I'm doing this wrong. That's it. Great book. What a read. My thumbnail is derived from the cover. I just cut these faces out and put it in the thumbnail. Spy and the Traitor, amazing story and one that has impacted all of our lives, whether we know it or not. So check out Ben McIntyre's book, The Spy and the Traitor. I also like The Spy Among Friends. Those are the two books that I've read. There's also, he has also written Rogue Heroes, which I haven't read, but I liked both books that he's, he's done and I think they're just so well researched and in depth and thoroughly done but also written in a way that makes you turn the pages i liked everything about this book besides the pictures the pictures are great i just don't know how to deal with them being thrown in mid-book when there's still stuff that has to happen so let me know how you deal with that if you haven't read this book if you're at all interested in spies if you like thrillers spy thrillers this is a book that i think you'll really enjoy and it's the added, I think, curveball that it is a true story. The, the song that I used for this video is mentioned in this book. They were listening to it on tape. This is 1985. And they're heading towards Finland and they were blasting this song by Dire Straits, Brothers in Arms. I didn't, I didn't know what the song was until it started. I was listening to it before I decided to use it for this video. And it's used in my favorite spy movie, Spy Game, too. So I was just like, wow, it's perfect. So I wanted to use it. But it was actually 
in in this book and in used in real life. Another one that I, I thought about using was the classical piece Finlandia, but I went with this once I heard it. I was like, oh, I gotta use that. Dire Straits. Again, Ben McIntyre, The Spy and the Traitor. If you like thrillers, if you like spy thrillers, if you like nonfiction that will keep you at the edge of your seat, this is the book for you. Thanks. Have a good one.